I'm Frances Dickey, uh, a editor of the TSL Aesthetic Annual, and I'm here in London with Jahan Ramazani, author of Poetry in the Global Age, his sixth book of poetry criticism. Uh, some other books include The Poetry of Mourning, The Hybrid Muse, and Transnational Poetics. So we are uh, so grateful to have your essay forthcoming, actually out now, <laughs> as of two days ago, um, in volume four of the annual. Um, Burying the Dead, the Wasteland, Echo Critique, and World Elegy. So I, I just thought we might start by my asking you, uh, what is World Elegy? Yeah. So I, I um, and of course I struggle with the term, as one always does with these things, but I, I um, think of World Elegy as elegies, quite simply, for the world, that is, homes of mourning. Uh, for the condition of the world, the death of the world, the dying of the world. Um, and um, part of the reason I came up with this term is that I, I was interested in thinking about Eliot's um, great you know, landmark poem in its uh, centenary year um, in a tradition that looks both backward and forward. So I'm interested in the ways in which the wasteland both looks back toward earlier poems for the world, and, and as it were, going back to Thomas Hardy by the deaths, by, um, uh, by the Earth's corpse. Uh, I might have gotten that right. Going back to Thomas Hardy um, and an elegy he wrote for the world, um, to uh, Lord Byron as well as a famous poem, Darkness, um, uh, which also elegizes you know, uh, an, an imaginary scenario in which the cold and darkness of 1816 um, became so severe that basically you had, uh, you know, all, um, all foliage and fauna, including humanity, die off. All the way back to John Donne's anniversary poems, which of course were written for Elizabeth Drury, a 14 year old. A girl, but everyone always complained that they didn't seem to have much to do with her at all. They're really much more an excuse for lamenting the state of the world, um, how dry a cinder this world is. Um, and Eliot, uh, interestingly enough, writes repeatedly about the anniversary of elegies as wonderful and strange and um, it, and I think one could say the same about the wasteland. So I wanted to, to see the wasteland in a kind of longer tradition of mourning for the world that also looks ahead to contemporary elegies for the state of our planet um, as we see ourselves perhaps moving toward the loss, obviously, of various species, um, and uh, perhaps even more dire effects of climate change. Um, and many of us are gripped with a kind of climate grief. Um, and I think there are ways in which Eliot's poem stands is looking back to that tradition, but also looking ahead to our own contemporary moment of mourning and anxiety about the state of our planet. So you, you're making the wasteland um, kind of a pivotal poem in this tradition that goes quite far back, mm -hmm. uh, long before uh, climate change was something that we were aware of, um, or it may have already been yeah. <laughs> um, in, happening um, as far back even as Hardy. Um, tell us a little bit about where you see that kind of trajectory going, you know, in, into to the contemporary time. Yeah, so, um, and of course, um, you know, I, I have to say, uh, Eliot's poem is not fundamentally a poem about anthropogenic um, climate change. It's not, you know, although Eliot is, of course, very much aware that the fog is a, a creation of, you know, coal smoke and, and, and coal burning fossil fuel emissions and so forth. Uh, he's very much aware that the river is being polluted. He's aware of, you know, the, these emissions, as it were, from uh, these the living dead who are crossing uh, London Bridge. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, various other ways in which humans are affect, 
affecting the health of the planet. But um, even though he's not, that's not fundamentally what the poem is about, I think later poets like Simon Armitage, um, Patience at Body, um, uh, um, you know, a host of other contemporary poets. Um, uh, you know, I, I think of people like Julian Aspar in the U.S. as well, um, who echo the wasteland, whether or not they share Eliot's outlook on uh, certain other matters, um, because he gives them valuable equipment for thinking about how do we grapple with, um, you know, um, D.A. Powell would be another example. How do we grapple with this sense that the world is turning into a wasteland in certain ways? Um, and um, so I, I think of Eliot's, um, uh, you know, doing valuable things like uh, coming up with a framework that can be large enough to encompass something as large as global and planetary conditions that are currently facing us um, as we look toward our possible destruction and even extinction. Um, and um, that's part of the reason, anyway, that the poem seems still valuable and important for us today. Yeah, at the end of the talk you gave here at the summer school, um, Robert Crawford asked you a question about um, you know, what Eliot can offer us today, and um, you know, given that so many of his assumptions are no longer valid for us, and um, I just love the answer that you gave him about the value um, of studying Eliot in a time of, of climate change. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, a time of climate change, a, a time of intense anxiety, I mean, you know. Uh, Frank Remote, of course, writes about the way in which, um, you know, uh, the, the imagination often goes toward the sense of you're, we're at the end of an era, we're, we're moving toward an end, and in doing so, it often recycles and draws on earlier kinds of apocalyptic images and so forth, and, you know, Eliot is doing some of that uh, as well in the aftermath of First World War, the aftermath of also at a personal level, his father's death, the death of his marriage, you know, the, the, the loss of Jean Vettel uh, all these um, personal circumstances impinging on him. And yet he's relevant today because he somehow finds a way of art, art, you know, articulating personal grief and loss that chimes with a larger sense of. Um, uh, you know, uh, broad, uh, calamitous uh, loss, on, on, you know, that affects Europe, that affects Ameri the Americas, that, you know, that poem, of course, famously reaches to other parts of the world, particularly to South Asia as well. Um, often we think of it as lamenting the state of uh, modernity, but uh, one of the things that I'm interested in thinking about in the poem is how it keeps looking for sources of solace, and yet every era in the past that it looks toward um, seems to be also beset with cruelty and violence and rape and torture and all the rest. So he's not just weeping for the golden age at all. Um, and I think that can be useful for us as well, because I think, as eco-critics pointed out, there's a certain danger in becoming fixated on the idea that, oh, if we could just go back to the good old days, because then that also gets you trapped in the sense that all we want is reversion when we need to be facing our complicity with uh, what's happening to our planet now. Um, and, you know, um, we need to be thinking more constructively about what we can do to perhaps limit damage of what is happening now to the planet. But, you know, um, Robert uh, Crawford, uh, I think even put the question, or maybe, maybe even, if you don't mind, more pointed way, uh, you know, namely, um, there are those who think that maybe Eliot should be canceled, and what my response would be to that. And I, and I think um, there, uh, you know, I, I, part of what I think of whenever I think of that 
um, is that number one, there are parts of Eliot that are really hard for us today. That his his sexism, his bigotry, his um, meanness to people who are around him, those things are hard, and I don't think we should try to whitewash those at all. And yet, I also think that he's shown that he can be he, the the tools he develops these um, yeah, in terms of you know, a uh, kind of global syncretist way of thinking. Um, he comes up with almost a way of writing poetry that moves us toward a kind of global consciousness long before the internet was uh, developed. And, and I think that's part of the reason that he becomes so valuable to poets of the non-Western world, poets um, uh, like A.K. A. Ramanujan or Arasha Hedali or uh, Christopher Pico or um, Lorna Goodison uh, or Kamal Brath, they all poets who cite him. And I think alert us to the ways in which even a poet, um, even poets like uh, these poets who have fundamentally different political orientations, who are uh, from parts of the world that, um, you know, from an Orientalist the mindset might be flattened or reduced in certain ways. Nevertheless, they find, uh, you know, valuable, powerful, um, imaginative um, resources in Eliot's work that they then bring to their own circumstances. So whether it's Kamal Brathwaite who, who finds uh, that that he can, um, uh, through Eliot's example of you know bringing a kind of conversational voice into poetry and a kind of multiplicity of voices he can bring his own caribbean speech rhythms into poetry through that example um, i could go into many others but i'll i'll, I'll just say that uh, um, i think we should learn from the poets take our cues from contemporary poets um, who are still you know for all his flaws um, finding um, you know, empowering aspects uh, of, uh, you know, Eliot's poet uh, tools and vision uh, that speak to us today. Poetry has to be for the present. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And, you know, as much as we love thinking about the past <laughs> as scholars, um, we live in the present. Absolutely. And we have to think about the future, too. Absolutely. So Absolutely. thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to read your essay. And, thank you. And, and share some of your thoughts with you. And I'm sure this is maybe the opening stroke or the opening movement of, of uh, another book, your seventh book. <laughs> um, well, we'll, we'll see. see. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis, for uh, giving me this opportunity. It's it's always really a pleasure to get a chance to work with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Same. Thanks.